Hello, welcome back. That's Bebe, my spouse's cat. She's very mean and grumpy. She uh, has been staying in our bedroom with the gate up because she doesn't get along with the other cats so well. And when Tuna, when Tuna uh, goes up there, he teases her and runs at the gate like he's gonna get her and so she screams and bangs at him through the gate. But she's been out for a bit, she's doing all right. Tuna, he always lays on his back to get my attention. Oh, look. It's Bebe. Bebe. She won't look at me. Aren't they sweet? Now she's mad that I'm talking. She's gonna get madder, isn't she, Tuna? I need to make this thing a little shorter for you all. A little, little quicker, I guess. Right, Tuna? Are you nice, Tuna? Tuna. He got horrible red eye in this video. It's not in real life, don't worry. He's not possessed, are you, Tuna? Maybe only sometimes. But, I need to get down to business. Can't ramble, look at cats forever. This is my fish. That's my tuna. My tuna over here and my fish over here. So let me just, let me just get into it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so welcome back. Welcome back. So, um, I'm realizing that, um, summarizing the whole reading, like I did with Noose, is, uh, a strain on me and it's repetitive for you, like reading the same thing and as I talk about. So, in this lecture, I'd like to make a few comments on the chapters assigned from Chris, uh, Greenow's book, Queer Theologies, The Basics. <clears throat> and I know, like, I haven't really been keeping up with the lectures that well, sending them out to you, but I swear, on this coming Tuesday, you'll have questions posted for your next response. And I am going to post a lecture by Wednesday. I swear, you all come and find me and run me out of town if I don't do that. That's enough of that. So first, let's talk about Greenow's introduction, where he defines queerness. Even to this day, queer can mean simply to be strange or odd. You might say, what a queer proposition to give a mouse a cookie or to give Bebe a cookie. Right, Bebe? She's, she's living her life, living, living life. Okay. What a, what a queer proposition to give a Bebe a cookie. Um, but you would more likely say, what a weird idea giving Bebe a cookie. So like queer, it's still used, but I think it's gone out of style, meaning to mean strange or odd. Um, queer also somewhere along the way, I'm not sure where, became a homophobic slur. But honestly, I think that in, in the 21st century, the preeminent homophobic slur in the United States, um, has become the F word, which I don't even want to say because it's so obscene. <laughs> uh, but the word queer, it's been significantly reclaimed by, and I've got a cat in my face, 
it's been significantly reclaimed by um, <clears throat> queer people and they've given it like liberative self-empowering meanings and then queer another meaning is that it, it can refer to queer people so it can be strange it can mean strange or odd it can be like a slur but it can also refer to queer people more specifically any LGBTQIA plus people who choose to identify using the term queer because not all people who are um, LGBTQIA plus want to be identified as queer so you have to ask like how how they think of themselves <clears throat> but the most important meaning of queer for our purposes for our academic purposes is <clears throat> to the capacity to disturb or disrupt. Queerness can be a noun, can be a verb, a participle, meaning disruption, to disrupt, disrupting. But what does queerness disturb? And the answer is <clears throat> the complacent assumptions about gender identity these cats always bother me only when I do this they don't they don't pay any attention to me otherwise now they're all on my lap all at once I'm annoyed at you cats you see them okay they have to get off <sighs> all, right. all right it's chaotic here is that okay well queerness it, it disturbs complacent assumptions about gender identity and sexuality that reign in the Western world today as Greenhouse says queerness quote calls for the uncovering and dismantling of power structures unquote that contribute to the oppression of people who are non-normative in regard to their gender or sexual expression in this way queerness is liberative it's a liberative quantity it shakes complacent so-called normal people and reigning structures awake and says look you're you're not all there is you're not the be-all end-all queerness challenges the theoretical assumptions and the concrete consequences of the white supremacist heteronormative patriarchy um, of the United States. The, the theoretical assumption um, that queerness would challenge is the oppressive gender binary. And a concrete consequence that um, queerness would challenge is something like hate crimes committed against the gender nonconforming against trans people, which is an enormous problem in the United States right now. Uh, all the all these hate crimes being committed even though the news is only talking about coronavirus right but all right that's queerness and theologically speaking where is God in all this of course as we've learned in theologies of liberation God is said to prefer the oppressed and stand in solidarity with them Queer theology is no different in that respect, yet there's more that can be said. So Greenow notes that queer theologians tend to hold that Christian theology has been queer from the very beginning, in some sense. On the most basic level, yes, Christian theology was queer in that it disrupted the accustomed ways of thinking and acting in its early stages. It was drawing on Hebrew and Christian scriptures that arguably are queer in some respects. For example, in the value laid upon the profound same-sex commitments made between David and Jonathan, Ruth and Naomi, and maybe more controversially, Jesus and Peter. Some early Christian thinkers, then again, 
and particularly those involved in monastic life. I'm a little disturbed by my fish because they're, they're gasping and apparently I need to change my water. I am not, I'm not pleased with this. Let's still try to enjoy their beauty. <clears throat> so early Christian thinkers, particularly those in monastic life, um, often envision themselves as passive, feminized recipients of the power of a god and a Christ represented as male. Uh, where they were getting this from is the Paul, Pauline scriptures saying that, right, comparing Christ to the head of the church and to the husband and then comparing the church to the body of Christ and to like, the woman who was under the control of her husband, basically. So you have that kind of conflation of um, church is the body of Christ, Christ is the head of the church, and woman as, well, and man as the head of um, woman. And, and that uh, like resulted in this situation where Christian monastics not infrequently thought of themselves as kind of the feminized recipient who Christ was ruling over as part of the body of Christ. <clears throat> and some of you, uh, if you've taken elements of Christian thought, you may have seen that St. Augustine in the 300s CE wrote, um, was writing in his book Confessions, and he portrayed himself as being in an erotic romance with the divine. A romance that replaced his lusting, his endless lusting after earthly flesh. All this being said, above all, I would say that Christianity has been queer from the beginning and that it was founded upon the revelation of a queer God. And that queer God is Christ. In Christian theology, traditionally, Christ has been envisioned as the enfleshment, the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, also known as the Son, S-O-N. The incarnation of the second person of the Trinity on earth. As the incarnation of the second person who exists eternally in the divine life, Christ offers a particular insight into what the divine life is like. Christ's person and work is kind of this um, very concentrated point of revelation of what the divine life is like. It's as though when humans are peering at Christ, they're peering through a glass darkly and grasping only like the foggy outlines of Revelation. Of these formulations, they're all according to traditional Christian theology. But as Greenow notes, quote, Korea theology often enters a party on the arm of a more traditional guest, unquote. And I've definitely found that to be true in the queer theology that, that I've done, personally. There's, um, and let me just give you an example of how queer theology is entering, queer, uh, queer theology is entering the party of Christian theology on the arm of a more traditional guest. There's an article that I removed from the syllabus for this course that I think is worth quoting. It comes from Marcella Althaus Reed, who is perhaps the most famous of the queer theologians, and you all are going to be reading her very soon. The readings um, from two of her books are posted on Colab for this, this week. So Althaus Reed, she draws on these traditional interpretations of Christ as God in flesh to make the point that Christ is a fundamentally queer figure. Now let me quote her at some length. She writes, 
Queer theology is an emerging discipline which takes as its starting point the radical and as yet unexplored nature of incarnation. That, div that the divine left the heavens and entered flesh once and for all is the queer ground that we inhabit. Christian theology and tradition holds fast to very rigid ideas about the nature of the world sexuality, sin, human nature, and fails to see the radical implications that they themselves declare. God dwells in flesh, and when this happens, all our myopic earthbound ideas are subject to change. The dynamic life force, which is the divine, erupts in diversity, and the energy of it will not be inhibited by laws and statutes. Far from creating the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, this dynamism is always propelling us forward into new curiosities and challenges. It does not shut us off from the world. It is the world drawing us into more of ourselves as we spiral in the human divine dance. The world is queer indeed, and those who wish to play it straight are failing to see that new horizons are declared holy, and we are prop propelled on in courage, not certainty." Unquote. So Althos Reed, she envisions Christ as Sarah Coakley did in our unit on feminist theology. She envisions him as a disruptive, boundary-crossing, transgressive figure. First of all, in that he transgressed the boundary between the eternal and the temporal, the divine and the human. Althaus Reed is suggesting that if in Christian theology the supposedly stable, taken for granted boundary between divinity and humanity has been crossed forever, then this calls into question other earthbound conceptions, um, specifically gender and sexual boundaries. You're going to be hearing much more from Althaus Reed soon, in particular about how Christian theology can understand the queerness of Christ and the queerness of the God that Christ reveals. Um, <clears throat> this type of queer theology is a theology of liberation. We get back to the theme of our course, right? Theology of liberation. But it is one, it is one for several reasons. It's liberative for individual queer people, certainly, who can see God in themselves and themselves in God, who can feel that they belong, that they're accepted and loved by a God who knows them, knows them intimately, knows their queerness as God knows God's own queerness. <clears throat> now imagine what a tremendous relief it would be to transition from believing that God rejects you, as Christians have been telling you, using texts of terror, to believing that God is queer, that God is in solidarity with you, is disruptive of the heteronorm and its assumptions, and that God has your back. But queer theology, importantly, is not liberative only for individuals, <clears throat> but it seeks to challenge and dismantle oppressive power structures. So insofar as queer theology is done only in theory, I imagine that it is ineffective, ineffective. But where queer theology is conceived of as critical reflection on praxis, as Latin American liberation theology is, then that queer theology that queer theology is something with very real power. The last thing I want to talk about in this video is queer readings of the Bible. Now, the other day, of course, as you know, I posted two videos, parts one and two, on Robert Noose's article, Seven Gay Texts. So it was an effort. Noose's article was an effort to present alternatives to traditional homophobic interpretations of the Bible.
but it was, was not any sort of constructive account of what queer biblical hermeneutics might look like. Remember that word hermeneutics it means interpretation, that's all it means. In chapter 4 of Queer Theologies, the Basics, Greenell offers an overview of the ways in which the Bible can be interpreted queerly. Of course, interpreters have drawn on the low-hanging fruit, I would say, of the uh, passionate relationships between Jonathan and David and Ruth and Naomi. There's no evidence that these relationships really, there's no evidence that these relationships were sexual. But there's also no evidence that they were not sexual. I mean, it's really open. Not yeah, but um, these these stories they've been taken up regardless as examples of powerful, emotionally charged commitments made between individuals of the same sex. It's difficult for me personally to read the story of Naomi and Ruth and not see that very real palpable passion. And that's why that, you know, those verses that Ruth says to Naomi, they're so often used in wedding ceremonies heterosexual wedding ceremonies, even though they were, it was spoken between two women. I find that um, suggestive. But what I was uh, most struck by, though, in this chapter, was the way in which intersex people have been finding <clears throat> a place where they fit in in the Christian scriptures and the Christian story. Intersex people, so Greenow informs us, are able to relate to the eunuchs of the New Testament. Since the eunuchs are figures who are not exactly male, not exactly female, they're in a fuzzy category in regard to binary gender. They challenge the gender binary. And actually, as you'll see in, um, if, as you'll see, or you already have seen in the Green Owl reading, there are multiple positive portrayals of eunuchs in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles. For those of you not able to get the book, which, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry that the global pandemic had to strike right when you all needed to order, like the only book that you need to order. <clears throat> but for those of you not able to get the book, let me read you an example of a positive portrayal of a eunuch that um, intersex interpretations of the Bible have drawn on. In Acts 8, 36-39, it reads, quote, and as they, the Apostle Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch. And Philip is one of the like apostles of um, Christ of the early church. <clears throat> They went down in the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught up Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. <clears throat> now, the Ethiopian eunuch here is uh, represented as someone who belongs in the Christian church just the way he is. He's someone who can be baptized into the church, as Christ's own body, as part of Christ's own body, where there is neither male nor female, but all are one in Christ. So it seems to me that the eunuchs of the New Testament, they're a very promising starting point for further exploration of the place of intersex people and other gender non-conforming people. <clears throat> in Christian theology and the church. So con to conclude, 
in my view, just my personal opinion based on studying um, Korean theology, it's clear to me that the Bible can be a liberative resource and a liberative guide for queer people, despite the fact that biblical texts of terror have been used to just degrade and destroy queer people for centuries. From a theological perspective, there is a liberative, divine power shining out from the text that cannot be stifled, cannot be mastered and domesticated or obscured by any degree of human complacency and misuse. Um, <clears throat> and that's the end of what I have to say for today. I wish you all well, and I will do my very best to have the next lecture on Greenow and Marcella Althaus Reed's texts up um, on Wednesday. Have the questions to you on Tuesday. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming.